This is Russia's Yazny military base, located near the Kazakhstan border. Yazny was ground zero during the Cold War, a Soviet missile facility designed to bring mass destruction to the U.S. Well, I can remember uh, when all these missiles, uh, you know, were, were feared. In the 1950s, uh, we didn't know from moment to moment sometimes because of the, uh, the rhetoric that was going on from Washington and Moscow as to, it was during the time when everybody had bunkers, you know, they had, they had the bomb shelters. Yazny is still a military base, but it's now home to the Russian aerospace company Kosmotros, old enemies now partnering up. But here we are at a military base, and they're actually hosting us and launching our spacecraft. Bigelow has come here to conduct a critically important test launch intended to prove his prototype, Genesis 2, can actually work. He eventually hopes to deploy several inflatable structures like this, 50 feet long, 22 feet in diameter, big enough for a team of 10 people to spend days or even months floating in zero gravity. These vessels um, are probably the wave of the future. I hope so. What I'm about to show you now is actual video of a Russian nuclear missile launch from Yazny Genesis 2 on June 28th, 2007. Security was very tight for us initially, and we couldn't take any pictures of the Genesis 1 launch. But as the Russians got to know us for Genesis 2, we actually had a CNBC television crew on top of the hotel filming the launch, and here it is. There it goes. Wow. That's great. That's great. Chuckle of a man who's purchased two nuclear missiles. There it goes. We like to say at Big Aerospace, reducing the world's nuclear arsenal one rocket at a time. Go, baby, go. Some of you may have also heard of our recent success on the ITAR front. I believe part of the reason that the Department of State takes me so seriously is I have many friends in Moscow with their buttons on missiles just like this. And this was the result. Uh, this is one of the first high resolution images that we got down from Genesis 2. Both spacecraft are very happy in orbit today. Uh, as a matter of fact, Genesis 2 recently celebrated its 10,000th orbit. Which brings us to our problem. If anything, Bigelow Aerospace has been too successful. Uh, back in 1999, when the company was founded, Mr. Bigelow and I thought that by the time we were even considering putting people up on a Bigelow habitat, that we'd be beaming back and forth, or purchasing Soyuz for $100,000 a seat, or riding on Venture Star. But if anything, over the past decade, not only have we failed to make progress, but human spaceflight capability globally has actually regressed. And this is the desperate situation that we find ourselves in, is that Bigelow Aerospace in the fall of 2007 uh, had not one, but two functioning spacecraft in orbit, one of which had already been there for a year. And frankly, it made very little sense for us to proceed with the program and put up more demonstrators because the first two had been successful and proved what we had hoped. And that's when Mr. Bigelow decided to move ahead, and we are now constructing the Sundancer, which is our first attempt at an actual habitable volume. Now, Sundancer, to be clear, is still a subscale demonstrator in the literal sense. It's smaller than what we ultimately want to produce, but if it works, we'll be able to sustain three astronauts on orbit, and we'll have a usable volume that's the equivalent or greater than Mir, all in one shot. Our problem is, is that we can finish Sundancer, and with Mr. Bigelow's financial wherewithal, his commitment, the success of Genesis 1 and 2, and the talent of our team, I have no doubt that we can do so. And as always with Bigelow Aerospace, even if the first one fails, we will launch another. But how do we get crew to orbit? Currently, there are literally no options beyond hitchhiking, as you see here. So it has become a great concern to Bigelow Aerospace. And I think it should be of great concern to the entire nation. Folks, we can no longer play around. In the next two years, Russia and China 
will be the only two nations capable of sending their citizens to orbit. That's an embarrassment to this nation, an embarrassment to NASA, an embarrassment to all, and is a situation that we must resolve. In the meantime, we are sending billions of dollars to Russia as the sole source provider of human spaceflight. An unacceptable situation. So, of course, the NASA, uh, the NASA, NASA's solution to this is Ares Orion and the Constellation Program. And our fear in regard to the agency is as we look at the history books, it's littered with failed government human spaceflight initiatives. I've still got my X-33 Venture Star t-shirt at home. And again, if history is to teach us any lessons, we have not had a successful human spaceflight development program since shuttle, literally 30 years years ago. And this is extraordinarily disconcerting to a company that has invested $185 million so far in a system that requires human spaceflight. You know, it was one thing when X-33 Venture Star failed, we at least had shuttle to turn back to. Now the situation is much more serious. Adding to the poor track record, like all of you, we have concerns as we read the papers and hear about mass issues, vibration, liftoff drift, and safety concerns. What we probably found most disconcerting of all with the Ares Orion system is the fact that we were looking at, I guess, only four seats. Uh, that is not a capability level that, frankly, we would find acceptable, uh, and we don't think NASA should find it either. Uh, during the Augustine Commission, we heard they may be going back up to six, which at least would be an improvement, uh, but that's something that we found very disconcerting, as well as all the other issues you read about in the press. Then when you get by the technical, uh, we get into the timing and the cost. Uh, again, 2015, as described yesterday, is a best-case scenario. Uh, we're concerned that it could slip substantially from there, and, you know, that's six years, seven years from now. And in regard to cost, listen, my boss, Mr. Bigelow, is a brick-and-mortar guy. Cost is where he begins and ends. And as we look at what's being said in terms of the budget for Ares Orion, the GAO came down and said that, frankly, you know, NASA can't even tell us exactly how much the price tag will eventually be. All the GAO did say was that they estimate that it will cost approximately $230 billion over the next 20 years. And that, to us, sounds like a great deal of money. Just to emphasize the point, we did a couple of calculations as to what you could purchase for $230 billion. Uh, 766,000 Ferraris which is also a transportation system. It won't get you to the moon, but I think you could have a lot of fun with that. Uh, 19 billion pizzas. Uh, as you can tell, I'm not against eating, but to me, that's a lot of pizza. Uh, or 4,509 seats on soyas if we want to stick with space. So again, we're very, very concerned with the budgetary figures. And this should not be seen as an attack or a knock on NASA per se. Really, in the end, there's plenty of blame to go around, particularly involving Congress, that they will not provide the funding. We're already seeing cuts. And part of the reason that X-33, Venture Star, and every other program that I put forward failed uh, is the fact that there is not congressional wherewithal for the funding. And so when we look at these failed initiatives from the past and look at what we're doing today and see these blockbuster budgets, we're very concerned that they will not be supported politically. And then we get to the other things that we've been hearing about. Uh, and again, we have nothing against Aries Orion. We you know, liked Mike Griffin and Scott Horowitz and the people who actually created the program. They were great supporters of commercial and wanted to take NASA out of low Earth orbit. We support it. But we hear a lot and read a lot in the press from the very NASA engineers who are working on the program that raise question marks in our minds. And you see a few of those here. Which brings us to alternatives that we're here to discuss today. And to be clear, we do not view this as an either-or decision. It is a false dichotomy to say we're either Aries Orion or we're commercial. All that we're saying is that we should have a backup plan. 
frankly, we don't know whether to believe you know, what you read in the press about all the problems or that everything's okay that we hear from NASA. We're not experts. We don't pretend to know everything. But we would say this, is that it's never a good idea to put all of your eggs